welcome to this special edition of the Belmont Journal. I'm Mike Crowley, your host. We have State Senator Will Brownsberger with us in the studio. Welcome, Will. How are you? Very good, thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, you've done quite a lot of work uh, aimed at improving public transportation. So I want to ask you what, what the funding outlook is for improvements in the MBTA system, as well as getting more commuters off the road. So uh, there's a couple different pieces to that. Mm -hmm. We always have to think of capital budget versus operating budget. So the capital budget being those big projects, those major maintenance investments, fixing the roof, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing is capital budget. Operating budget being day-to-day -day expenditures. Um, so in the context of the MBTA, the capital budget has gone up uh, year after year, they've more than doubled their capital spending over the past few years. Okay. They're going to keep keep increasing that. And I, so I think a lot of great work is being done on the MBTA, and I think people should feel excited about the future of the red line and the orange line and the green line and the bus system. So a lot of the right things are, are being done on those. Um, but so, so I am wondering, Will, um, you know, people have been, you know, if people have been paying attention to the news, they've, they've heard that the, the, the governor has an $18 billion um, borrowing bill. Has a yeah, yeah, so let's, let's, let's break it down. And, and uh, the borrowing bill is sort of a routine thing. All right. I mean, it's been marketed a little bit like it's a big deal, mm -hmm. but there's billions of dollars of debt authorizations outstanding already, and uh, this is just sort of part of a, the routine process of, of, of borrowing for, um, for capital expenditures, and not all of that, um, much of that goes to things other than public transportation. Um, but, and, and, and the, the government, from the governor's perspective, they, there's no additional funding contemplated in that $18.4 billion. That's just okay. the sort of routine turnover of uh, grant anticipation notes, gas tax bonds, et cetera, that uh, allow us to fund our ongoing transportation investments. So, so it's, it's fair to say that, that it doesn't represent anything fundamentally new? It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. It represents a continuation of the capital planning that's been going on at MassDOT for the past few years. Um, to be clear, though, that the, the, the MBTA portion of that has gone up dramatically, and the right. amount of money going out the door has gone up dramatically. And so there's a lot of good work happening, which is going to re result um, in the uh, significant improvement of our subways and bus systems. Okay. What I want to emphasize is that the real challenge right now, I think, is funding the MBTA's operating budget at an adequate level. The operating budget meaning the number of people on the MBTA team okay. um, needs to go up substantially to accomplish a number of things. The most significant probably being safety. Not that the MBTA is unsafe. I ride the MBTA more or less every day myself, and sure. I, I, I never worry about safety. But um, the incident that happened with the derailment in the red line a year ago inconvenienced that millions of people, basically. And, and this is, you know, it, it happened because we have inadequate safety inspections? It happened because we have inadequate safety inspections. And that's the, the MBTA, to its credit, opened the door up and had brought in uh, some of the best transportation experts in the, in the country and then said, what are we doing wrong? Are we doing anything wrong? Are we not focused enough on safety? What do we need to do? And they said, yeah, you are doing something wrong. You, you, you are not investing enough in safety and you do not have a safety culture. And so we need to do that. So that means more people. Okay. That means more people in inspection. We need more people for safety. We need more people for resiliency. We need more people to uh, manage the buses in the field. Why do you have seven buses going in a row all bunch sure, together? Sure. Because that's that's inadequate management mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And, the, and a twenty-year-old system for. Well, it's a twenty-year-old system. That, that's right. You've read my thing about that. I did. But the uh, the technology um, the technology is a limit. I mean, we mm -hmm. could have better technology that managed spacing of buses better, but barring that, uh -huh. we need more inspectors in the field, um, and we need more people to, um, for, for planning, for planning, for figuring out what, what the next steps are. We could try to give the MBTA more money in various areas, but they couldn't really spend it on the capital side. They're spending, 
just about as much as they possibly can on the capital side. They're working well, really that, hard. That's an, interesting, that's an interesting point because so many people, and, and myself included, look at the system and see that um, compared to some other systems, although many uh, systems in the U.S. Are, 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 are getting fairly aged, but, but this, this system in particular um, you know, suffers from, from um, just a lack of capital, a lack of sufficient capital investment to, to, to bring it into the future. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, how, uh, what's the source of funding to pay for the operating side increases that we're going to need? I, I know that the House, the House has legislation that would um, uh, increase the gas tax. Um, they've imposed new fees on Uber and Lyft. Um, uh, is is this is this something that the Senate will also take up? Is that the answer uh, for increasing uh, the revenue needed to to boost the operating side? Uh, what what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think the we do, the Senate has not uh, developed its approach uh, yet. Uh, we, we we're having a lot of conversations. When I say we have not developed our approach, we have not finalized an approach, and so I don't I don't know what the mix of of revenues sources will be. I do think we probably do need to raise some additional revenue to cover that, those, those increased um, positions at the MBTA to address safety, resiliency, planning, mm -hmm. field management. I think the MBTA's um, the advisory board held a meeting uh, a week or two ago, uh, well, I guess two weeks now, where they reviewed their budget and they actually proposed to add, they're trying to add a thousand positions to the MBTA to, to address that collection of things. Can, can I ask how many positions they have? They have about 6,000. Okay. So that's a significant, significant increase. And they, can, and they, they lose about 500 people a year. Mm. So they're trying to, in effect, you know, the, where they really like to be is 500 down, you know, a thousand up. So we really want 1,500 new positions. They can't do that. They can't hire that many people. So they're, they're, they can't, if, if, they were, if they could hire all those people, you'd be looking at about a um, $90, $90 million deficit that they need over and above what they have. And the governor, uh, over and above what the governor has already given them, proposed to give them, which is about a $135 million increase. Okay. So um, it's hard to I, I'm, I'm sort out the exact numbers, but I think the MBTA needs maybe about $100, $200 million additional uh, above, what, above what they have today for next year. And in future years, they're going to need more because we've added South Coast Rail, we've added Green Line Extension. These, every additional service that we add needs more money because no service makes money, right? Right. So although people pay, the net of, the, the, the net cost, it's always the, a net the, cost. The system operates off of public subsidy. It operates off of public subsidy and it's important to, Think about why we do that. At the end of the day, um, we want people to take the MBTA because if they didn't, uh, there would be complete gridlock. On, on the radial routes into the city, meaning you know, people headed in from Belmont to Boston, people headed in from Stoughton to Boston, mm -hmm. take those together. The MBTA at rush hour is going to account for 30, 40, 50 percent of the traffic. 24-7, 365, it's a much smaller share, but at rush hour, when it matters most, when congestion is the real issue, the MBTA is a very important factor. And so if we didn't have that, the, we wouldn't be able to run the city. I, an old transit planner said something to me which makes, which is stuck with me, and, and, I, and I think it's really important for people to hold on to. Um, the transit system is to the city as an elevator is to a skyscraper. That's a, that's a great analogy. You, you just cannot get the people in and out without having that. And so we spend money to make it work. And we do spend, you know, a thousand, two thousand per rider, per annual, you know, per annual rider to make that work. But that's, that's how we have economic activity in the city. We wouldn't have it without the system. That's an interesting st statistic. Um, we, we have seen some recent improvements in, in bus service in the Belmont area. Yeah. Um, do, and I, I know that you've been looking um, and, and also seeking improvements on the commuter rail lines. Um, um, is there anything that we're likely to see on the Fitchburg line um, in the near future in the way of improvements? Um, or, or, you know, what? 
Yeah, no, look, so the, the, the rail system, I mean, you're bringing us to the right place. The, the, the commuter rail system is, is the part of the MBTA where we don't have a clear plan. Mm -hmm. The MBTA's got a very clear vision for the red line, very clear, clear vision for the orange line, very clear, clear vision for the green line. In a period of time, we're basically going to have new subway systems. You're going to have a new red line in, mm -hmm. in three or four years between new tracks, new power, new signals, new cars, spiffed up stations. It's going to be a new subway. We don't have that vision for the commuter rail, mm -hmm. and it's complicated with the commuter rail because you have multiple lines within that bucket. You have sure. like 14 different lines, and they have to think about it on a couple of different levels. They have to think about it from a fleet standpoint because mm -hmm. they do shift trains from one line to another all the time. There's all kinds of good reasons to do that. You don't see red line cars running on the blue line, sure. but you do see Worcester cars. You know, you know, you can't tell the difference. They move, they move them around as, as need be, uh, and so there's a fleet strategy dimension. Do we have enough? locomotives that work? Do we have enough coaches? And the answer to, the, to those questions is no, we don't have enough and the MBTA uh -huh. is recognizing that and, and certainly acquire, moving to acquire a lot of additional coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, on the locomotive side, there's this conversation about what should the power mode be? Right, D it, diesel versus diesel, electrification. electric, bi-mode, and then the other, the, there's this other conversation which is do you want to have a traditional push-pull consist. The word consist means, you know, a, a locomotive and several coaches. Yeah, right. You know, that, that's a consist. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to have a traditional consist, or do you want to have what's called EMUs, where you've got electric multiple units? Each each one of the units is independently powered. There's no locomotive, like uh -huh. a subway train. Like a subway train, do you want to run something like this? And there's advantages to that because you can couple and decouple them in a more flexible way and run shorter trains, run longer trains more easily. So, some of these things require the, the, the purchase and deployment of, 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 of a lot of new equipment and, 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 and frankly, they're, they're capital intensive. And, uh, they're, they're very capital intensive. Right. And especially the elect once you start talking about electric, you're not only talking about the equipment, but you're also talking about the electric conduits. Mm -hmm. We do have electrical, the, the, the busiest line in the system is the Providence line. Uh -huh. And that, that, you know, that's the line that's basically serving the South Shore, coming up along the Southeast Expressway. Uh, that line is already electrified. Mm -hmm. So we can put some electric there, but does it make sense to split our modes? Uh, that's, that's a subject that there isn't a real consensus on, Okay. unfortunately. Okay. Uh, there's a strong argument for electrification, but then again, there's a huge cost associated once we get past the, that, that one line. And what should we do? Should we, should we experiment on that line? The MBTA board seems to be leaning towards doing that. They did mm -hmm. pass a resolution last November, but how that fits into the capital plans or what it really means, nobody knows. So I'm unhappy with that situation, and I'm unhappy with the fact that we don't have a clear plan for the Worcester line and the, and the Fitchburg line. And the MBTA tends to want to think about the fleet side of it, mm -hmm. but they're not addressing the what are the problems on each line. And there, 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 there are technical problems that are different on different lines the, you know, to the extent they they mix freight and passenger, right. or, they ha or they're set up to mix freight and passenger, they're, they're le less efficient. Parking issues are different on each line. The potential e for new parking facilities is different on each line. They're, so, they're nowhere near getting to those issues. So, so, so we, need a, we need a plan there. We need a plan, a and, and what that comes down to is we need the people. We yeah. don't have the people. We have some great people at MassDOT. We have uh -huh. some great people at MD, MBT. I'm not taking a thing away from the people who are there. There's just not enough of them, and they're okay. spread way too thin. They're just spread way too thin. Uh, so that's that's our problem. Let me. Can I ask you real quickly? So, so given that there is a clearer plan for for the the the, the you know the, the MBTA for subways for, for the, right the subways, um, is there any thinking around how we funnel more people um, into that system? Who may live at, at 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 a bit of a distance, but but perhaps not too much of a distance to to uh, you know improve things like shuttles. So 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 what I'm thinking is there any thinking around can we have a better feeder system into Alewife? Yes, yes. I mean there 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 that is on the table. That that is being looked at. The the MB, the Alewife is clearly an opportunity. Look, if we with the investments we're making, we expect to achieve a 50% increase in capacity in the red line. So that means that you could be taking more people out of Alewife. Mm -hmm. Now, Alewife has for a long time been totally maxed out, right? 
there is a lot of suppressed demand there. There are a lot of people who would like to be able to reliably park at Alewife and get on the subway. And, and there are just, frankly, limitations on capacity for parking, right? They, there's a, there's the, the garage is what it is, and getting in and out of the garage is a real problem at the intersection. So the MBTA has, look, has, has made some interim repairs. There was spalling concrete that was really caused by leaks in the roof, the top mm -hmm. deck. The top deck is all done, and so they're working down to fix the lower decks that you know we're continuing to have problems as a result of water coming in from the top deck so that's 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 in progress that'll stabilize things for a few years and probably the way things go long you know more than a few years but ultimately there's a belief that they have to do a new garage it, there it has to be replaced. Uh, and um, i i've i've there is some interest and some i have interest and uh -huh. i'm sort of trying to foment interest in the idea of could we put something out at route 2 and 128 Hmm. and have shuttles in there. You could achieve a, a dedicated bus lane from Route 2, at, from, from 128 along Route 2 all the way into Alewife. Once you, you know, the, there's a, basically an extra lane on Route 2 today between uh, 128 and Lake Street. Mm -hmm. And then from Lake Street, the buses could get off and do Acorn Park Drive and have that to themselves. Uh, so I think you could get buses from, be, be, through the traffic uh, and, and make that an efficient and attractive way for people to, to go. And, and likely we would need to do that anyway in order to replace that that parking facility at Alewife. What right? I yeah, what I what I would suggest what, what makes sense to me is let's have a parking a satellite parking at 128, and then let's have then take down the garage at Alewife, replace it, and then have both. Sure. You know that that because I think there's a lot of potential, as you say. There's 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 the p ability to pull more people on. The MBTA is not that interested in investing in parking. This is something I've I've been learning and. They're, they're thinking, oh, well, maybe we're not going to need parking in the future. People are just going to get delivered by autonomous vehicles and then they'll get on the train. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, they, we don't want a huge stranded asset. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, I, this, is, this is a framing, a mind issue that we need mm -hmm. to address with the MBTA. There, right. There's a school of thought now that says building more parking is a bad thing to do. I, I, for better or worse, look, here, here's a stat. All the transit systems in the state, all the modes of transit they offer, account for two billion passenger miles per year. But we drive about 60 billion passenger, about 60 billion miles, so more passenger that's, miles than that. That's maybe, an amazing maybe, statistic. Maybe 70 or 80. So, so the notion that somehow we're gonna get rid of automobiles, uh, we can get rid of automobiles downtown from, mm -hmm. from, a, from a Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, maybe Belmont kind of standpoint, dramatically reduced automobile use is a possibility. But from a larger regional standpoint, that is just fantasy. We have to, so that's why. And it, it partly breaks down because, because of the lack of, of good public transport options as you move farther out, right? And you can't achieve public transport. We have built a system that is decentralized. We, you know, in the 20th century, we spread out. And if we are concerned about climate change and we think we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the next two, one, two or three decades, we're not going to do that by completely rebuilding our housing and industrial stock. That's just not going to happen in two or three decades. It took us a couple of centuries to get where we are. It would take us a much longer time to sort of reconcentrate and so that everybody could be used public transportation. What we have to do is electrify the, the private vehicle fleet. We have to make private transportation and vehicles much less, much, much less expensive. I mean, excuse me, we have a much less much less carbon emissions. And so, so if from an environmental standpoint, that's what we need to do. We have to achieve electrification. So, so that makes sense. But moving into moving to greater electri electrification of vehicles doesn't doesn't deal with the, the problem of too many cars on the street. So I, I, actually, so, so, I actually wanted to hear your thoughts if, if we could shift into um, um, automated traffic enforcement. Well, let, let me, let's just let's just close the loop there okay. though, if we can. I mean, for the rush hour commute, mm -hmm. the MBTA is the solution. For the rush hour commute, and commuter rail is the solution. So we have to get people out of cars onto commuter rail, and I think that means more parking in remote locations. Sure. And that's not something the MBTA has been warm to, which troubles me. I'm, I'm upset about that right now. Working on that. Okay, I, I'm, I'm good, uh, to, good to hear that. But now to come back to the, to, the, to the automated enforcement. Look, I think the automated enforcement thing we're talking about is, is a very targeted thing. Uh, we've actually narrowed it down to say we're, we're going to do um, something in, in at most 10 communities mm -hmm. uh, and with mass dot approval. The goal is... So, so I wasn't aware of that. So so what we're talking about at this point is is something akin to uh, 
um, a, a pilot or limited deployment? Yeah, or? that's right. Uh, and it's about safety. Mm -hmm. It's about safety, not, the, it, there's a lot of things have been done in other states that have really been about money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's given automated enforcement a bad rap and a deserved bad rap. Because in a lot of other states, there was kind of a, a corrupt relationship between these camera vendors and municipalities. And think Ferguson, Missouri, where you've got an extractive municipality just charging people to live, and the cameras being one more way to extract money from the populace, and the camera vendors making money when the municipal officials sure. sitting happy. And that, that, that has happened in other states. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're doing here. We are totally limiting, we're saying you cannot make money in this. If you make money by chance, you have to send it back to the state. You cannot make money. Uh, if you, um, and this is always a local option, uh -huh. and, if, and you cannot charge more than $25 a ticket, and you cannot charge tickets, charge people for borderline offenses. Uh, you, uh, if you're in the intersection already when the light turns, you know, you can't be charged, that kind of thing. Um, so what we, what we do know, though, is that when you say red light, camera enforced, uh -huh. when you say speeding, camera enforced, when you say don't block the box, camera enforced, it does change behavior. There's no question about that from a national standpoint. And, 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 that's, and, and we want to do that in urban areas where it makes a difference for, the, for, for free traffic flow and where it makes a difference for bike and pedestrian safety. Well, I was just going to raise that point, the, the, the bike and pedestrian safety, because, yeah. because I, I drive occasionally and I just see so many cars running stop signs, running red lights. Um, I, you know, I fear for my life when, when I'm a pedestrian and, and I, I, you know, I fear even more when, when, when my kid is, is out walking around. Absolutely. Um, and, and I know everyone else does. Absolutely. No, it's gotten out of control. I mean, look, there's no way, pe people do know that they can get away with things. And we all do, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, we all push the light if we're, well, a bit, if we're in a bit try, of a hurry. I try, I try not to run the red ones. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, 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 you know, like, I, I don't, I don't want to hold myself out as better than anybody else on this, on this kind of thing. But, but when there's no enforcement, we're all tempted, right? Sure. And, um, and there is no enforcement. There's just nowhere near enf enough enforcement out there. And we cannot put it out there. There's too much traffic. There's too many congested locations. There's too many problem locations. Police officers are way too busy. Uh, in Belmont, you know, we, we only have a few officers out at any given time. In, in Boston, in Back Bay, where I represent, there's one traffic officer for all of Back Bay and Fenway. It's, it's clear as, as, you know, if you drive around the state, um, it's, it's clear that, that it, doesn't, it doesn't get much better anywhere else. Uh, no, and it's especially a problem. I think, I think this is a, the, 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 the demand for automated enforcement is, is coming from my constituents in mm -hmm. places that have, where there's a lot of traffic uh, that's, Making it unsafe for bicy for for I don't want to say bicycles for you know for pedestrians yeah for pedestrians and you know school kids uh, places where speed people are speeding past schools and they just can't get it under control so there's there are neighborhoods that are really asking for this enforcement and and residents of neighborhoods saying we want more enforcement and we want the the camera enforcement if we can't get police well. These are these are great things. So so you've t you've talked about you know a limited set of communities. Is is there any possibility that Belmont by, might be one of these communities that? Well, I haven't had. Uh, I've, I've certainly had people uh, in 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 Belmont ask me about it. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a conversation with the selectmen. I haven't. Uh, you know, so Belmont has not stepped up and said we definitely want this at this point. I see. As a town, that has not happened. But I've oh. certainly heard from a lot of individuals. Um, can can I? So you've talked a little bit about it, but. Um, um, I'm just wondering if we we could sort of wrap up a little bit with talking about public transportation and and improving traffic and, and traffic safety from the perspective of you know how this impacts um, our climate change goals how this how this how this helps us deal with the fact that we're living in a in a in a a, a metropolitan region that is continuing to grow. So so I I actually I used to say. People say, what are you doing about climate change? And I say, mm -hmm. I'm working on transportation. <laughs> I don't say that anymore. Because really, I've come to see them as two different challenges. Okay. The congestion challenge, the growth challenge, uh, you know, I mean, growth, uh, you know, the, we just 
growth of people in this metropolitan area. Those are problems we need to solve with public transportation. But public transportation will not solve our greenhouse gas emissions problems. We have to focus on electrifying the larger fleet. Coming back to that, that statistic, mm -hmm. today we have 60 billion miles driven by Massachusetts vehicles. We only have 2 billion passenger miles served by public transit. There is no plan, there is no scenario w under which the three or four, three decades from now we're gonna quadruple our public transit ridership. There's no way we do that. We don't have anything remotely like a thought of doing that. But even if we did, our traffic would still be 90% in automobiles. Sure. So we have to, have to, have to electrify our private vehicle fleet and we have to make the grid green. We have, you know, because if you, you can electrify vehicles, but if they're getting their power from a coal plant, that doesn't really do any good. <laughs> so those, th those are the twin things that we have to do from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, if we're going to okay. cut our greenhouse gases uh, substantially over the next uh, few decades. And by the way, um, you know, just one thing to acknowledge, that is, but I, I, it's just very hard to do, is if we could share our vehicles more, if we could have two or three people in a car instead of one person in a car most of the time, that would help a lot, and there's certainly a lot of people going in the same direction, but getting people to get in the same car together is, is something that we've been talking about for decades, and we've actually been moving in the wrong direction so far. They, there, were, there was more people carpooling in the 70s than there are now. So that's one area where, where perhaps we need some additional focus. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I don't know whether that'll work out or not. All right. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Will. We've been talking with State Senator Will Brownsberger on this special edition of the Belmont Journal. Uh, that's all for now, and we will see you next time.